this time we're going to have a video presentation from Dr. Don Kate Preston. We hope the stream for everybody to enjoy. Hello everyone, my name is Don K. Preston. I appreciate the, op the opportunity and the invitation from Michael Miano from there at the Blue Point Church in New York. I could not be with you in person this year, but Michael asked me if I would be willing to present this DVD presentation on the power of preterism. Why is preterism growing? What can we do about it? What does it mean? You know, this is really quite a vast topic, as I'm sure all of the rest of the speakers at this conference uh, have shared with you. I am sure that some of my thoughts will have already been echoed, or will be echoed, by, by many of the speakers. I probably am not going to say anything particularly new or earth-shattering. That is, unless you are a, a student of the Bible that is just now beginning to to hear about, to think about, and to investigate this thing called preterism. May I share with you just a few thoughts about my own journey into the full preterist view. I was raised as a fifth generation member of the Churches of Christ. Now what that meant was I was raised as a non-millennialist. I was taught from you know, the time I was knee-high to a grasshopper, so to speak, that our fellowship had all of the answers. We were right, and we could not be wrong. When it came to eschatology, however, I found that the commentators written by my brethren in that fellowship very, very often disagreed with one another on fundamental eschatological uh, passages, and they differed radically. As a prime example, one of the great, quote, champions of the faith in my fellowship wrote and said concerning the marriage of Christ. The marriage of Christ, not the betrothal, the marriage of Christ took place on Pentecost, and anyone who said otherwise is a heretic and a false teacher. Well, in my own personal studies, I had seen that that didn't seem right. Paul said over here in Corinthians that he had betrothed the church to himself. Well, betrothal and marriage are not the same. Betrothal was powerful. It was legal. It, it was important. But it was not the marriage. In direct contradistinction to this man, who was viewed as a champion of the faith, a defender of the truth, a great debater, a teacher of the truth, another man of equal prominence in my fellowship said, Christ betrothed the church at Pentecost, and he will not, be, he will not actually marry the church until the second coming. Well, I was stunned. It's like, wait a minute. I thought my fellowship had all of the answers. I thought we couldn't be wrong. And yet here were two extremely prominent, very powerful, quote, defenders of the faith, unquote, both of them supposedly great apologists for the truth on eschatology, yet they each took a position diametrically opposed to each other saying that anyone that held a different view is a heretic. Uh, the so-called unity, unity on eschatology was shattered in my mind. Now that's certainly not what made me a preterist, I must confess to you. But in my journey to the preterist movement, there was one seed thought that did in fact really take hold and caused me a problem. It's while I was in seminary. 
as we began our study of the book of Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians particularly, my professor walked in one day at the very beginning of the course, and he said, Brethren, i got to tell you, I have a real problem with Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Now, you have to understand that in my fellowship of the churches of Christ, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 is just a favorite text. I mean, you can, to use the terminology of those of us who in seminary, seminary and, and preachers, you can really wax an elephant, <laughs> wax eloquent on this text because, boy, it's dramatic, it's powerful. To you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those that do not know God and that do not obey the gospel. And preacher after preacher after preacher would point to the audience and say, and say have you obeyed the gospel? If you have not obeyed the gospel, Jesus is coming back in wrath and in vengeance against you. You must obey the gospel. Let's all stand together and sing the song of invitation. Well, the professor said, Brethren, I got a problem with this text. And everybody's kind of looking out of the corner of their eye, like, what in the world is he talking about? How could you possibly have a problem with this text? Now I want you to remember it, and I want you to realize that at this point, I didn't have any major problem at all with my own personal eschatology. But it was shocking to hear my professor say he had a problem with one of these texts that in my fellowship is considered absolutely foundational, easy to understand, undeniable in its application. Well, somebody, don't know who it was, spoke up and said, Brother Stewart, why do you have a problem with this text? And he said, well, fellows, here's the, here's the reason I have a problem with this. He said, when you go back to verse Two, and following, number one, it's very clear Paul's writing to the Thessalonians. He's not writing about some far-off generation. He's talking about the fact that they were being persecuted for their faith. But we always start quoting it, verse 7. But he said, fellas, the context does not begin at verse 7. The context begins, if you want to get serious about it, verse 4. And goes on, and he said, what's really troubling about this text is that here is Paul writing to people being persecuted for their faith, and Paul is promising them relief from that persecution when the Lord comes. And he said, now, I know the Lord didn't come. And he said, if that doesn't give you a problem, I don't know what to tell you. And he said, I don't know what the solution is. And we're all sitting there going, no, 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 you know, that can't be true. But I remember reading verses 4 and following and going, huh. Well, the seed had been planted. When I graduated from seminary in my very first preaching job, I was challenged to teach the Olivet Discourse. Now, I want you to realize what I'm saying here. What is the power of preterism? Why is it growing? As I taught the Olivet Discourse after one year of preparation, I had, become, I had come to the conclusion that the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 and 25, could not be divided into two different subjects, the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70 and a yet future coming of the Lord at the supposed end of time. I, I, I was raised believing that it could be divided. I was raised believing that it had to be divided. And yet here I had come to the conclusion so radically different from my brethren and from my fellowship that it was like, wait a minute, where did anyone get the idea that the disciples were asking about two different, two different subjects? Long story short, at the end of the presentation and teaching of that course on the Olivet Discourse, the ladies to whom I had been teaching this material asked me to teach Revelation. I was stunned. I didn't want to do it. Have you ever been perplexed about Revelation? Well, in my fellowship, you just basically didn't teach on it. If you taught on it, you taught from the letters to the seven churches, and then you started all over again. Or you basically approached it, and you said, well, I may not know everything 
about Revelation, but here's what I know. Number one, the good guys win. And number two, it doesn't teach what the dispensationalists believe. <laughs> That's about the depth of the uh, analysis of Revelation. I know of some churches in the Churches of Christ Fellowship that during the 50s and 60s actually forbade their ministers from teaching the book of Revelation. When I was asked to teach Revelation, I, I was, to say the very least, somewhat frightened. Although in my study and preparation for the teaching of the Olivet Discourse, I had begun to see the direct correlation. I, I embarked on a one-year intense study on the book of Revelation. I realized very, very soon that the traditional dating of the book was wrong, very easily dispelled, very easily discounted, very easily falsified. Now, do you begin to see just a little bit of a tiny hint as to why covenant eschatology is growing? Now, you may be sitting there going, uh, wait a minute, I'm not, not sure I understand. If you're like me, Revelation had been a constant puzzle, a constant source of consternation, a book to be avoided. But after my personal intense two-year investigation, which has continued now ever since 1976, okay, the book of Revelation is no longer that bewildering book. Do I have questions about it? Undoubtedly. Do I have a framework for understanding it that is clear-cut, unequivocal, and undeniable? I most assuredly do. I no longer am totally 100% perplexed by the book of Revelation. Do you see some of the power of preterism in that? To be able to explain, at least in framework mode, what the book of Revelation is really honestly about. Well, I have to tell you that after teaching the Olivet Discourse and the book of Revelation, I was well on my way to challenging and questioning my traditional views, the views of amillennialism. And I'll make a long story short here. After several, several years of struggling with my personal eschatology, attempting to desperately at times to hold on to my traditional views. And yet, all during this period of time, I begin to see how the skeptics, the agnostics, the atheists, the Jews, the Muslims were using the story of eschatology of Jesus' predictions and the predictions of the apostles and prophets of Jesus, turning those turning those predictions into instruments of attack on Christianity. I read, I encountered atheists who said, look, Preston, Jesus said he was coming back in the first century. He didn't do it. He's a false prophet. I read article after article by Jews. Anyone can see that Jesus predicted he was coming back in the first century. He didn't do it. He's a false prophet. Friends of mine encountered Muslims using the exact same argument. Everyone knows Jesus predicted he was coming back at the end of the world for the first century. He didn't do it. He's a false prophet. Do you know what? I looked because I was confronted. How am I going to explain the undeniable reality that Jesus did in fact say he was coming back in that generation? In judgment of all men. Frankly, I didn't know how to deal with it for a long time. Oh, I tried one day as with the Lord a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. But I soon discovered, and I wrote my very first little track about it, I soon discovered the answer to the question, can God tell time? And the answer is, yes, he can, he did. Unequivocally told the truth about time. And you know what? When I began to see that when God communicated with man about time, and you know what? If you are a beginning student of preterism, I prefer the term covenant eschatology. But you may be sitting there going, oh, wait a minute, uh, didn't Peter say one day is with the Lord a thousand years, a thousand years as a day? Yes, he most assuredly did. But here's something that's critical to understand about that. 
Peter didn't cite that prophecy, which is Psalms chapter 90, verse 4. Peter did not cite that reality, reality about God in order to say, now look, I want to tell you something. I'm going to tell you that the coming of the Lord is at hand. The end of all things has drawn near. The time for the judgment has come. But remember, it uh, doesn't mean anything. What kind of a communicator would God be? If God, through the Holy Spirit, inspired Peter to say, as he did, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 5, that Christ was ready, which means imminently, ready to judge the living and the dead. The end of all things has drawn near, 1 Peter 4, 7, and the time, the appointed time, has come for the judgment to begin. Now, did God communicate to Peter and tell him, Peter, here's what I want you to tell everyone. Here's what I want you to write. And then Peter turned right around and said, uh, now, I, I know that I said all those things. I know, and I know it sounds like that the end really has drawn near. But remember, it really doesn't mean anything at all. That's kind of like you telling your kid, I'm going to get you a horse really, really soon. But uh, I don't mean soon at all, because you don't know what soon means, do you? <laughs> really? Our God does not communicate, has never communi communicated to man in that way. So my journey, my personal journey, encountered the power of preterism and the reality of the truth of God. That God has always communi communicated truthfully to man about events that God said was going to happen in man's world according to the calendar that God himself gave to man. And there is no justification. None whatsoever for us to go to the time words of Scripture and to try to relativize those things, elasticize, plasticize those things into absolute meaningless. Now, I don't know if you've ever done this or not. And if you're a beginning student uh, of covenant eschatology, I would, I would urge you, I, I would highly recommend that you do this. By the way, if you don't have a copy of my book, Can God Tell Time, please get one. Because I, I break this down in that book. But in order to counter the time statements of Scripture, we must be able to destroy, negate, mitigate an entire vocabulary of words. We must be able to mitigate and counter and negate not only specific words, but different forms of expression of eminence like this generation, not now, but then, not for you, but for them. It wasn't near then, it is near now. How do we do that? Listen, folks, my journey into covenant eschatology came face to face as we all must, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, came face to face with the reality of this. And the more I studied, the more I realized that the power of God's word must take precedent in my life. Now, I want to tell you something, if you don't already know it. I knew full well that to accept the power, to accept the authority of the scripture, in its testimony that violated my tradition, five generations of tradition, to take a position on Scripture and Scripture alone meant that I was going to put myself outside of my fellowship. Now, I want to tell you, that's part of the power of preterism. And Jesus warned his disciples in Luke chapter 12. Those who said that they would follow him, Jesus said, you better count the cost. Part of the power of preterism is viewed negatively by many people. I'm not going to, uh, not going to mince words here. If you love the Lord above anything and everything else, 
And if you love the Lord and his truth above anything and above everything else. And in your studies, you begin to see the power of preterism. You are going to be persecuted. You are going to have people say, you know, our, that's not the position of our church. That's not the creedal position. Where do you find that in church history after all? Just recently on Facebook, someone posted some citations from some of the early writers and said their evidence or their testimony bears weight. And my response to that was, why does it bear weight? This particular author that you are citing was, quote, eccentric, unquote, to say the very least. Who are we going to take as authority? So let me say to you once again, part of the power of preterism can be viewed negatively. Fair warning. Fair warning. Jesus told his first century disciples, he told his first century apostles, if you follow me, the world will hate you. If you take a stand versus tradition, versus the creeds, versus history, you're going to be cast, castigated, you're going to be criticized, you're going to be ostracized. But the power of preterism is that finally, in your own personal life, you are going to have the answers. Are you going to have every answer? No. You know, I get up somewhere between 3.30 and 4 o'clock every single morning. And I hit the books. And I have to tell you, learning is such an exciting adventure to me. And I have to tell you, right there in my office, uh, where my computer is and where my study resources are, uh, you know, I'll, I'll stumble onto some gym that I've never seen before. And it's almost like, yes, wow. And I'll literally get up and I'll pump my fist. And, you know, I, I guess I look kind of silly if somebody were to see me. But i got to tell you. The study of God's word liberates us. It invigorates us. And it empowers us in ways that perhaps we've never known before. So let me see if I can systematize just a little bit. A bit of the power of preterism in the time remaining. You know, I, I could spend lots and lots and lots of time uh, sharing more with you about my journey into preterism. But this is about the power of preterism, why it is growing. If you are not already aware of the fact, the Jews, the Muslims, the atheists, and the agnostics, as I've already mentioned, continually use the eschatology of the New Testament against Jesus and against the apostles and against the inspiration of the Bible. Bertrand Russell, who was an agnostic atheist in the last century, wrote a book, Why I Am Not a Christian. He gave five reasons why. Bertrand Russell said it's more than obvious that Jesus said he was coming back in the first century to judge all men at the end of the world. It's very clear that he did not do it. His apostles reiterated those predictions. He did not do it. The Bible is not inspired. Jesus is not the word of God. He died as an agnostic. Look, anybody and everybody that can read can understand that Jesus did, in fact, predict his coming for the first century. It is shocking. It is appalling to me to read the desperate attempts of modern-day evangelical Christians to escape the reality of those predictions. John MacArthur, in, a, in his book, in, in a so-called refutation of preterism, said... It is undeniable that the apostles of Jesus believed that he was coming back in their lifetime. And he admits, well, of course, the skeptics use that against them and against inspiration. But uh, 
But it really doesn't work that way, he said. The reason that Jesus told them of his coming and expressed it in, in terms of imminence is because he wants every generation to be, quote, on the tiptoe of expectation, unquote, to live as if he was coming back in every generation. No, folks, I want to tell you. With all due respect to John MacArthur, that is as false as false can be. And by the way, he was challenged to debate me publicly, but categorically rejected that invitation. Jesus never said, some standing here may or may not die until the Son of Man comes. Jesus said, assuredly, I say to you, which is extremely strong in the Greek. Amen, lego humin is the Greek term. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here 2,000 years ago, which by no means shall taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. It doesn't get any clearer than that. The Jews... The Muslims, the atheists can read it. Covenant eschatology, preterism, allows us to take that at face value linguistically, grammatically, contextually. We don't have to apologize for it. We don't have to rest it and twist it and distort it. The power of preterism is such that we can stand before the world and say, Jesus kept his word. Why is preterism growing? Because people who are looking for answers are finding, pardon me, the answers to this conundrum. People who want to believe, but who are troubled because they see the problem. And they also see this. I, I tell you, this, to me, this is one of the greatest powers of preterism. Folks, you do realize, I hope, how incredibly sad the history of Christianity is in regard to false prophecy and in its misunderstanding and misapplication of Jesus' predictions. When we take Jesus' prophecies in this rigid, woodenly, literalistic uh, application and interpretation to demand that he was predicting that one day he was going to come out of heaven as a five foot five Jewish man riding a liter literal cloud at the end of time and the, uh, the time space continuum. Number one, we have basically, fundamentally distorted the meaning of his words. We have ignored the Hebraic Old Testament prophetic background of those prophecies, we have imposed a Western, Hellenized, Grecianized definition on that terminology, on that language, and ignored where it came from. And you know what the result of it has been? The result of it has been that in every single generation after the first century, the church has been making one false prediction after another. And I want to tell you, both believers and unbelievers are sick and tired of it. Unbelievers are going, well, there it is again. Another false prophecy. If you want to see it, if you want to see a catalog of the embarrassing history of Christianity, you need to get the book, The Jewish Unveiling of Revelation and the End by Al Garza. Now, at the back of the book, all right, uh, let, let me see what page this begins on. Uh, let me see. Uh, this begins with in the second century, late first century. All right. And the chapter begins extra, extra library of date setters for the end of the world. So starting here on this page, guess what? 
to the end of the book, which looks to me to be 30 pages, Garza chronicles one failed prediction after another. Look at it. That's pathetic. All of us are familiar with the failed prophecies, the tragedy and the heartbreak that, is, that has come as a result of that. Harold Camping and all of his repeated failed prophecy and people giving their money away, going absolutely broke. broke. Hal Lindsey and all of his failed prophecies, people giving their money away, going broke, and never a dime of refund by Lindsay or Camping or any of the other camps. And by the way, just recently I received notification by way of email, a preterist in, in England, informing, they, informing me that the Jehovah's Witnesses in England are once again back at their date setting or their dire predictions of the end is near predictions. So much so that they're actually encouraging people to give their goods away. Now, I'm thankful to say that this individual has been sharing my YouTube videos with a lot of these individuals, and they're, become, and they're getting rescued from that. But just two, about two weeks ago, he told me of another couple that had already given away all of their goods. He was that afternoon supposed to share with them some of my videos. Let me tell you something. Today, you and I as preterists, or you as a potential preterist, have the potential power in our hand to finally bring resolution to this long and sordid history of failed prophecies by showing, yes, Jesus did predict he was coming back in the first century. Number two, he kept his word. I don't have to make excuses for Jesus. I don't have to say, well, yeah, at hand didn't really mean at hand. Quickly, well, that didn't mean quickly, it meant rapidly. Folks, all that is nonsense. I can stand before the world today, and I do stand before the world today, as an unabashed, unapologetic apologist for Jesus Christ and for the veracity of his word. After all, I want you to consider this. Jesus said, John chapter 10, 35 to 37. This is so powerful. If I do not do the things which my Father has given me, do not believe me. Do not believe me for my word's sake. Believe me for my work's sake. Now, folks, that's a challenge. It's a challenge to you. It's a challenge to me. I get so upset when I hear Christians say, well, you know, uh, I don't have to prove Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus said, yes, you do. Jesus said, I do. He had to prove who he was. So don't give me all of this emotively based, emotionally based nonsense. And please, I, I'm not trying to offend anybody. But don't give me all of this stuff. Oh, I don't need exegesis. All I need is Jesus. No, Jesus said, don't believe me if I don't do what I tell you I'm going to do. You know what the power of preterism is? The power of preterism is, I can take Jesus at his word when he said that in that generation, the great tribulation would take place. The Son of Man would come on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and gather together the elect. You say, but nobody saw it. They did if they had the eyes of faith. They did if they understood that prophecy in the way the Hebraic scriptures explained it. They saw it. But do you see the power of preterism to be able to answer the skeptics? Look, about... Seven or eight years ago, I challenged a Jewish website who was using failed eschatology to refute Jesus as the Son of God. I wrote them an email and said, I will have a public debate with you 
on this question, did Jesus fail or not, they wouldn't even talk to me. Because I want to tell you something. If you take this sugar stick of eschatology away from the atheist and from the Muslims and from uh, the, the Jews and the agnostics and what have you, their house crumbles. Jesus cannot be accused of being a liar or a false prophet. I've got to share an anecdote with you. For 15 years and more, I had a booth at the Abilene Christian University Lectures in Abilene, Texas. We had a booth there. We would distribute materials. We would have Bible studies with everyone who came along and who would listen to us. And one of the incredible things that happened over and over and over and over again, and we're talking, we're talking people with Bible degrees. We're talking about master of theology students. We're talking about doctoral students. We're talking about professors in some cases. And they would listen to our spiel. They would listen to our story. And they would offer some objections. The objections would be answered. And they couldn't, they, couldn't, they didn't have an answer. And finally, in desperation, many of them, many of them, I don't mean just a few isolated examples. I mean, many of them would literally step back and go, well, okay, you know, what difference does it make? What difference does it make if he came or if he's coming? I must admit I was absolutely, totally stunned when I heard that the very first time. Forget eschatology for a minute. Forget all about these failed predictions for a moment. What difference does it make if he came or if he's coming, right? No, forget all that. Jesus said, the Son of Man must go up to Jerusalem, there be betrayed, crucified, buried, and rise again on the third day. But hey, hey, what difference does it make if he rose or not? I mean, you know, what difference does it make, right? Just because he said he was going to. Do you see how silly some arguments are? Do you see how desperate some arguments are? Listen, the power of preterism is, point number one, I can show, I can prove Jesus kept his word. Point number two, I love this. Because Jesus kept his word, I can have full assurance of my salvation and my relationship today. Look, in the fellowship in which I was raised, I was taught, now let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And that was taken to mean, now if your good Baptist friend says, are you saved? then you're supposed to say, well, I don't really know, but I certainly hope I am. But I won't know until Jesus comes. Isn't that comforting? Now, my Baptist friends didn't even realize the power of their own question. They didn't even realize uh, the power of, don of their own assertions that we have today, eternal life. You see, you can't say with confidence that we have eternal life unless Jesus has come. Because if Jesus failed to do what he said he was going to do, we don't have eternal life. Hebrews 9.28 says, unto those who eagerly look for him, that word eagerly there is a very powerful word for eminence, by the way, which means it was supposed to be expected in their lifetime 2,000 years ago. But to those who eagerly expect him or look for him, he shall appear a second time apart from sin, watch this, for salvation. Why was Jesus coming? To bring salvation. You see, in the New Testament, there is a tension between the already and the not yet. Some passages say they were saved, but others say, like Hebrews 9, they were looking for salvation. Some passages say they had received grace. Others say they were looking for grace that would be brought at the day of the Lord, 1 Peter chapter 1. Invariably, the things which they were said to possess they were then told that very thing was coming at the parousia of Christ, and invariably the parousia was coming soon, imminently, never far off. Now just think about that. 
if Christ has come and I am in Christ, then I can most assuredly say with John, this is that which overcomes the world, even our faith. 1 John 5, 2 and 3. And John wrote, just before the end, by the way, just before the parousia, by the way, John wrote, Little children, these things write unto you that you may know that you have eternal life, and this life is in his Son. 1 John 5, verse 12 and 13. You see, John was living right there on the cusp of that parousia that would bring to reality that eternal life. The power of preterism is that because I know Jesus kept his word, I know because I'm in him, I have that life. Is that powerful or what? So the power of preterism, to me, I, I've just got to tell you, the power of preterism has brought such calmness, such assurance, such peace, such confidence into my own relationship with God. I have absolutely no fear of the future. I have absolutely no fear concerning my salvation. <laughs> I got to tell you, being raised in the fellowship in which I was raised, basically they taught you that, you know, if you've been a bad little boy, uh, just one sin and you're out of there. You're out of God's grace. And uh, when I was a teenager, let's just say I wasn't being the best little boy in the world. That's enough said. Uh, well, our house was situated on a corner, long, 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 long sweeping corner, curve. And uh, I had red curtains. And I got to tell you, my conscience really bothered me a lot about that time, about some of the things I was doing. One night I was kind of, I was, you know, in that never, never land, not quite asleep, not quite awake, and uh, had my eyes closed for the most part. A, a car was coming from the west around that corner. Well, headlights always shone in my bedroom. I don't know why that night it just hit me suddenly like it did, but the headlights shone on my red curtains, filled the room with red light, and I thought, this is it. He's come. And I'm lost. That was on Saturday night. Next morning, I was walked right down the aisle. <laughs> because I was so fearful. Because I had no concept of the grace of God. But thanks to my understanding of covenant eschatology, full preterism, I have a far, far greater appreciation and understanding of the grace of God. And my what peace, my what peace it brings to my life. And the third reason to go back to the first is the power of preterism is that it, it's really a conflation of point number one and point number two is that it gives us the opportunity to rescue so many other people from that same fear, from that same discouragement, from that same uncertainty. And let me share something with you that happened just a couple of weeks ago. Now, I hear from people virtually every day. But a couple of weeks ago, I was sitting in my office, and the phone rang. And this lady said, I would like to order some books. I took her order, and Directly, she goes, uh, who am I talking to? I said, well, this is Don Preston. And she was going, oh, my goodness, I'm talking to you. I'm really talking to Don Preston. I, well, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. And she said, I want to say something to you. Okay. She said, you saved my life. And I, I, I've just got to tell you, I was stunned. I was startled. I said, well, ma'am, what in the world do you mean? And she goes, I want to tell you something. She said, I've been a dispensationalist all of my life. But she said, I've seen one failed prediction after another. You know, all these predictions in the back of this book by Mr. Garza. 
She didn't list any of them, but she's lived through Harold Camping and Hal Lindsey and Grant Jeffrey and Tim LaHaye, all of whom have predicted the end for the last generation and for this one. And she said, I've got to tell you, I've lived in constant fear. The man of sin. Oh, my goodness. The abomination of desolation. It's around the corner. Oh, my goodness. The great tribulation. And she said, I was living in constant fear. But she said, my husband and I took a trip not long ago. And she said, I was sitting there in the hotel room, and she said, I was sitting there fearful, thinking, is it going to happen? Is it going to happen? And she said, I flipped on the TV, and who do you think was talking? Well, it kind of escaped me for a moment. I said, well, I don't know. And she said, it was you. Now, a little bit of a backstory. My great friend, Dave Warren, from Maui, Hawaii, has been so wonderfully aggressive getting pr full preterist DVDs shown on public access television in Hawaii, Albuquerque, Portland, Phoenix, New York. Uh, just Dave Warren has done a magnificent job, folks. I mean, it's just incredible. He has saturated the Hawaiian islands with preterist DVDs showing on public access television, free, okay? So anyway, this woman says, who, who do you think was on TV? Oh, well, I don't know. It was you, and you were talking about Israel 1948. And she said, I was stunned at what I was hearing. And she said, I called my husband who was in the next room. I said, honey, come here, come here. You got to listen to this. This is it right here. She said, we listened and watched, and it just unfolded for us. And she said, we've been watching you on YouTube. We've been watching you, and we've been getting some of your books. And she said, you saved our lives. We have completely abandoned the dispensational view. And we are now living in joy and in assurance that Jesus kept his word. We're not afraid of the man of sin or the abomination or the great tribulation anymore. We are free. I, I, I got to tell you, I got very, very emotional over that. Folks, this is the power of preterism. It frees people from the fear that Hal Lindsey's been telling us now for generation and a half the man of sin is alive somewhere in europe even today it fears uh uh frees us from the constant fear oh well y2k you know this is it the world's going to come crashing down what were we told 2010 2012 you know uh, i got an email from a fellow who told me that without a doubt whatsoever uh if the bible's inspired jesus was coming back october 2012 i wrote him back and I said, sir, with all due respect, you're wrong. Jesus came back in the first century, and I said, when your prediction fails, I want you to contact me. Well, you know, 2012 came and went. And by the way, he was predicting the whole gamut. Great tribulation, et cetera, et cetera. Man of sin, you, you name it. Well, he didn't, did not write me after that did not come to pass, so I wrote him. I was kind, I was gentle, I was respectful. And I said, you had promised to get back in touch with me. He was kind enough. He was honest enough to say, Mr. Preston, you're exactly right. And he said, I'm just shattered. I don't know what to do. And I said, please, please restudy. There's an email on my desk right now from another gentleman who says, if the Bible is inspired, the Lord will come in 2017. I wrote him back. No, no. It won't happen. The power of preterism is it frees us from all of that. And even if we're not talking about dispensationalism, it frees us from the view of amillennialism that says Jesus could come back at any moment and burn the world up. 
And even if you've got the post-millennial view, which, to be honest about it, has no excuse whatsoever for not being full preterist. None. If you read the writings of Gary DeMar, for whom I have the greatest and utmost respect, if you read the writings of Kenneth Gentry, same thing about my respect for him and his scholarship, if you read the writings of, of Joel McDermott, you know very good and well their writings, their hermeneutic leads directly to the full preterist view. Gary DeMar wrote a book, Why the End of the World is Not in Your Future. Hello? Listen, folks, the power of preterism is such. That it allows us to free not only ourselves, but it allows us to free others from, from the grip of fear of the future. And you know what that means for us on a very practical basis? And I've got to close this out. Let me just touch on a few things. On a very, very practical level. For too long, Christians have been totally uninvolved in the political process. After all, why should we be involved? You don't polish brass on a sinking ship, right? Perhaps it is time for Christians to rethink. Perhaps it is time for Christians to think about becoming, uh, becoming aggressively invo involved in politics and, become, and be, become the political leaders that will take our nation and our world into a brighter future with the realization that we don't have to have war. We don't have to have conflict. What would our world be like from a very practical perspective if the power of preterism could be conveyed conveyed to say number one israel no longer owns that land by divine right the muslims do not own that land by divine right but there are two groups of people here that have a right to live somewhere now would that be an easy process absolutely not but we've got to start somewhere the implications of covenant eschatology for world peace, the implications of covenant eschatology to impact, pardon me, foreign policy of any nation is absolutely profound. And folks, we, we barely, 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 barely begun to, to crawl in this process, much less to walk or to run. But I want to, want to challenge you to begin to think about the implications of the future if Christians who understand covenant eschatology begin to be involved in the political process to stop the insanity of foreign policy here and in other places. Secondly, what about ecologically? Now look, I'm not a tree hugger, okay? Uh, I enjoy hunting and fishing. I enjoy going out in the woods. I certainly am not one of those that does not believe you ought to never cut down a tree. But do you know what? If we believe in the power of covenant eschatology that this world is not destined to come crashing down or to be burnt up, perhaps, perhaps, just perhaps, it means that our young people ought to grow up and take positions of responsibility to be responsible ecologically in our world. Not in that radical tree-hugging sense, but in a sense of responsible ownership of this world. Responsible management of this world instead of the raping of the rainforest, instead of the raping of the land that goes in there and just rips out a swath of territory, does no restoration work whatsoever. How does the power of preterism affect that? Well, I'll tell you what it, it does. It says, you know what, folks, we're going to be around a long time. Maybe we ought to take care of this planet that we're on. Thirdly, the power of preterism is such that it ought to impact every single area of our, our life in, in regard to racial discrimination because the power of preterism is that in Christ there is no male or female. There is neither black or white, to insult, insert those words. There is neither Greek nor Scythian. There are no racial parameters in Christ. It stuns me to realize there are still people who have resentment to those who are not the same color they are. That is inexcusable for those in Christ. These are but a few of the many implications of the power of preterism. Why is preterism growing? Because people are finally getting answers. 
because people are being delivered from fear. Because people can see the tremendous implications of covenant eschatology for the future of our world. Because with preterism, we have the power to refute, to answer, and to refute the enemies of Jesus Christ. Look, folks, <clears throat> I've said this many, many times. Covenant eschatology is not a spectator sport. Now, everyone has different talents, talents, different abilities. Not everyone has the makeup, so to speak, to be a loudmouth like Don K. Preston, <laughs> to engage in formal public debates. Okay? I understand that. But you can partner with, with someone else. You may, you may be able, if you'll please excuse me, you may be able to partner with Preterist Research Institute financially to allow Preterist Research Institute to, to enlarge our outreach and to be able to confront more and more the enemies of covenant eschatology. You may be able, you know, one time I heard one guy say, you know what, you, you may not be a preacher, you may not be a teacher. Your, your only real talent in this world may be that you can take a track, lay it down somewhere, and run. <laughs> well, I'm pretty sure you got more talent than that. But you can help spread this marvelous, wonderful, solid truth of covenant eschatology. Why is covenant eschatology growing? Because it's the truth. And the truth really does set us free. Thanks for the opportunity for being with you via this DVD. God bless you. Join with me as we march into the future boldly and with confidence and with the truth of God's word behind us and with us to transform our world. Thank you.